Well, here we are, sort of six weeks into looking at a rule of life, using the books, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry and When Church Stops Working. Today, we're going to look at two more practices as we look at how to unhurry life as part of our journey to be apprentices of Jesus. We've already explored the idea of Sabbath and desert. Today, it's simplicity and slowing. I wonder how often, and I've asked this question before in this series, do we find ourselves distracted by all the things around us? Over the last few weeks, as we've explored this ruthless elimination of hurry and look to develop a rule of life that, G- that embraces the life that Jesus is indeed inviting us to, how many times have we found ourselves distracted or busy? I imagine the answer is, if we're really honest, very often. I've been practicing this way of life now for a few months. And when it works for me, it works really well. But when it doesn't, and I slip into the mindset of the world, and I find myself as busy as possible, I find it incredibly jarring now. It's worse than before if I've slipped back into that mindset of the world, and it takes me even longer to slow down and unwind at the end of a day. But before we start to think about simplicity and slowing, we need to take a look at where we are now. I came into ministry from a, prof- blah, blah, blah. I came into ministry from a profession that demanded I build at least eight hours of work a day. If I fell short at the end of the week, there was some explaining to do. On Monday morning, you didn't bill enough time this week, Tim. The answer of, but I had five hours of unbillable meetings last week, was not going to cut it. The question would be, well, why didn't you stay late to bill your hours? Make sure you are billing eight hours a day, no matter what else you have going on. It was ruthless. And it was made even more demanding by the clients expecting that everything they wanted was done yesterday. Apologies if any of you are dealing with lawyers at the moment. When we first took a case on, the terms of agreement with the insurance company who paid our fees said that we had to advise on the prospects of success within 28 days. The amount of times I made that initial call to the client said, hello, it's Tim from this firm of solicitors. They said, I can't wait 28 days. It's more urgent than that, Tim. If we got to a point where we would issue a claim for them in the employment tribunal, the company would have 14 days to respond. And 99% of the time, they would put an application in to ask for an extension of another 14 days. And it was always going to be successful. But the client would then go, but I didn't agree with that. In some ways, it's tough. They wanted an answer there and then. They wanted an answer to their case within minutes, not within months. And when I told them that we were looking at between 6 to 12 months to even get to a point where we can start preparing for a hearing, the air was often blue. Those were the clients who we were representing as well. It wasn't even the other side. Those were people who we were acting on their behalf. Managing their expectations was a huge part of my task as a lawyer. It's all about managing the expectations of clients. If we expect things done yesterday, as my clients often did, we're always going to be playing catch-up and always thinking we've not done enough. We need to do more. We then start to feel stressed and overwhelmed with all that we have to do. And then we start looking at the figures showing stress and burnout are on the rise. But when we start to practice slowing down and simplifying, we actually find that we're no longer playing catch up. We're able to be proactive and get things done ahead of time. And I believe that this can have a profound impact on our lives and more importantly, in our relationship with God. Now, in When Church Stops Working, the authors talk about waiting on God. 
and how waiting actually brings life, not a slow death. Waiting brings life, not a slow death. This is countercultural to what society is telling us. In society, everything is getting faster. Internet speeds, mobile data speeds, online deliveries, speeding on the motorway, loading times on PCs, the list goes on. You'll gather most of those are tech because it's me that's speaking. Now, I really like playing computer games as a way to switch off. And one of the things that I have noticed that has crept into reviews recently is this game is great because it has no loading time. You don't have to wait for the next level to load. And if you buy the latest hard drive, it now reads at 7,200 megabits a second instead of 4,000. It's all about the speed. In real terms, you're going to see 0.01% of a difference. Waiting, as we've explored, is something we've become really bad at. You might remember a few weeks back when I mentioned seeing a traffic jam as a spiritual discipline. How are you doing with that, by the way? When we practice slowing and simplicity, though, one of the things that we can do is wait. Now, when I talk about wait, I'm not talking about waiting for the sake of it. Like we do when we're in a GP surgery, if you're fortunate enough to get a face-to-face -face appointment. But deliberate waiting. Being very deliberate in the practice of waiting. Waiting on God for him to reveal what his plans are for us. More often than not, we have to wait longer than we like. And we don't understand why. But it's all part of our journey to being apprentices of Jesus. As Andrew Root says, the real crisis is encountering a living God who is God. God is real. I've got a typo. That should say God is God. And we are not. Apologies for my typo. And then he goes on to talk about the church. We've become so focused on the crisis of decline, talking about the church, that we deny or push aside the crisis that we are broken and sinful people. A weak church who are called to wait for the God who is God to act in our midst. At most meetings I attend... Church is on decline. That's all you get told. It's about bums on seats. It's about how many people have you got on a Sunday. The Church of England, every year we have to submit a form called Mission Statistics. It's an awful, 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 awful form because it only looks at the numbers. What's your average attendance? How many people are on your electoral roll? How many people have come off your electoral roll? How many people have attended your Fresh Expressions? If you're not doing a Fresh Expression, why not? It's an awful form. It's all about numbers. Indeed, I can log on to the, the, the safeguard, the, not the safeguard, and hub, I'm getting confused now, the parish hub on the Diocese of St. Albans website and look at the stats of this church. And it basically, it's showing the, it in graph form. That is no good. That is the crisis of decline that the church wants us to focus on. But what about if we start focusing on ourselves, knowing that we are broken and sinful people? Knowing that actually we're part of a weak church. Not a declining church. A weak church. Because as a weak church, we have to rely on the strength of God. God who is going to act in our midst. So how does all of that link in with the rule of life about becoming better apprentices of Jesus? Well, friends, what if we were to just slow down wait on God, and simplify our lives to become more like him, to model our lives on what Jesus modeled in the Gospels. The reason I chose Mary and Martha this morning for our reading is because it's one of the many times that Jesus speaks directly into a situation where someone is busy and someone is waiting. We know the story well. I'm sure we all do. We've heard it this morning. Martha is busy doing the jobs, getting frustrated because Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to him. I can hear myself in Martha. 
particularly when Hannah was young and when Joseph was young and Amanda was pretty much glued to the baby as you are when you're breastfeeding. And I felt myself saying, why am I doing all the jobs though and you're just sitting there? I found it particularly hard, as I say, when Amanda was there, I was doing all of the jobs and Amanda was just sat there feeding Hannah and then sleeping or just sat on the sofa in my eyes. But it wasn't me that had gone through the experience of giving birth. It wasn't me who was going through the experience of having to wake up every two hours to feed a crying baby. I was there to support Amanda in that. And it was when I realized that, that we got that equilibrium right. It wasn't a case that Amanda was just sat there doing nothing, feeding Hannah. That was an incredibly important task, probably more important than making sure the dishwasher was loaded, making sure that the right meal was cooked, because if Amanda had stopped feeding Hannah, she wouldn't be with us today. Now, Martha is busy in our story. And I imagine that she's clattering around the kitchen, doing the dishes, preparing the meal. You can imagine the pots and pans in the background. And Mary is just sitting there. Now, the worldview is that Mary is wasting time because she's not actively doing anything. Yet Jesus tells her sisters that Mary has chosen well and it will not be taken from her. In some ways, and this might be a stretch on the text, so bear with me, I wonder if we're more like Martha's at home and Mary's at church. When we come to church, we deliberately set aside time for God. We deliberately give our Sunday morning, where there's so many other things out there that we could be doing, to come and spend time with our family, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and with God. But when we're at home, we're probably a bit more like Martha, doing all the jobs that need to be done. Perhaps, though, we get a bit like Martha at church sometimes, when the preacher's speaking too long, and we start to see this. When the service is going on a bit long, and you get fidgety and distracted, because you're thinking about your chicken that's going to be burning in the oven that you've set to be ready for half past 12, because we always finish at 12 o'clock. Why? It's probably because we have those plans later, and we're wondering that extra half an hour with God at church is going to disrupt the rest of our day that we have planned out. Yet Jesus tells Mary it wouldn't be taken away from her. When we invest time in God, friends, it is time that is never, ever wasted. It is time that brings us life, that brings us joy, that brings us hope. Indeed, earlier this year when I spoke at AFM, their service was three hours long. And not one person was sat there doing this, looking at their watch when it got to 90 minutes. It was just expected. It was part of it. People were coming and going. In the West, we've become so set on our 90 minutes for church on a Sunday morning that if it's 91 minutes, we're out the door. I know that this church wants to become a church that brings life to people through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we want to do that, we have to start with ourselves before we start looking outside. As I, th- I think it was John Wimber that used to say, you can't minister to people until you've been ministered to yourself. Do we need to be ministered to ourselves in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can go out and minister to others? Perhaps that person you're going to meet when you go to the co-op to buy your milk. Perhaps that neighbor that you see when you get home and get out of your car. And you think, oh, but I've got a meeting in half an hour. Well, it's okay. That neighbor's in tears. Invite them in for a cup of tea. If we've not been ministered to ourselves by the Holy Spirit, we can't then give out to somebody else. When we are prayed for, it is not a waste of time. Even if we don't think anything has happened through our prayers, because in God's economy, nothing is wasted. Waiting on God brings us life. Our culture of speeding up and being able to buy things 24-7, either physically or virtually, has made us impatient when it comes to waiting. 
I ordered a DVD from America recently, and it took 10 days to arrive. And I noticed myself getting more and more impatient as I tracked it across the States, across the Atlantic, and into the UK. And why has it got held up at Heathrow? Yet earlier this week, I've decided to buy a new game. And it arrived within three hours at my door from me ordering it to it arriving on my doorstep. That is the way that the world wants us to do. Same day delivery is the latest craze. Get it on your doorsteps. With all of that going on around us, we have to be very deliberate to not get sucked into the way of the world and becoming people who wait on God. Don't get sucked into the world and get busier and busier and busier. But we need to be people that wait on God. When we get frustrated that things are going slow or we're not hearing from God, it's because it's not in his timing yet. But by slowing down, it allows us to rest. It allows us to hear from him. It allows us to learn to live the pace of life that Jesus did. Indeed, yesterday afternoon, I allowed myself time to stop. I was on the sofa. I think we were watching something on TV. I was cuddling Joseph, who was asleep on me. And then after about 30 minutes, Amanda asked if I'd had a nice cup of coffee. Because I'd actually been asleep for the half an hour, and my coffee was still sat on the arm of the sofa. I hadn't even realized I'd nodded off. But by allowing myself that space to slow down and stop in the afternoon meant that I got everything that I needed to get done quicker and more efficiently so that I had more time in the evening with Amanda. It doesn't sound like it should work. My list of jobs didn't shrink because I had a half an hour nap. But it does work. As I've said a few times during this series, when we slow down, it actually makes us more productive in the long run. We need to learn to slow down our mind and our body so that we can taste and see that the Lord is good. If we're rushing around from one thing to the next, we'll miss those things that the Lord is doing in our midst. God puts things in our paths regularly so that we know that he is with us and walking beside us, but often we're just too busy to actually see what they are. So I want to ask you, friends, when you leave church today, don't rush home and think, I've got to get home. Unless, of course, your chicken is going to burn, actually, so I don't want your house to burn down. But don't rush home. Enjoy your journey home. However far that is, whether it's walking across the road or whether it's driving to Hitchin. Take time to enjoy your journey. Interesting, one of the things Amanda and I have noticed, when we tow our caravan, we have to go slower because of the different speed limits. And we actually find that we don't mind it takes longer, and we just enjoy the journey for what it is. Often it's when we're going away. So actually you enjoy the fact that you're going somewhere, and then when you're on your way back, you talk about all the wonderful things that you've done. But most of the time around Luton, when I get in my car, it's because I'm going to a meeting or I'm coming home from one and thinking, what's next in my diary? I don't enjoy the drive. Our phones, indeed, have become a distraction tactic that make us think we need to be contactable 24-7. Smartwatches have made the effect even worse. The email that just came through now, it doesn't need replying to right now. You're in church. You're focusing on God. You're listening to the Holy Spirit. That email that's come through that says urgent actually isn't that urgent. might be important. Leave it till you get home. That text message that you received when you came in the building, leave it till you get home. Communication these days is built on the premise that we will respond immediately, there and then, in that moment. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I could text Brendan when I get home and think, he's not replied, it's been five minutes. I text him again, why haven't you replied to me? when it's because he's spending time with his wife out on a walk. Otherwise, we get follow-ups, don't we? I've done it. I'm guilty of this. I'm just checking you got my email. It's been two hours since I sent it, and you've not replied yet. We're all guilty of that at times. So, friends, there are some very practical things that we can do to slow down our mind and our body 
and in the process, learning to wait on God. Not just in our own lives individually, but in our corporate life as a church, as the family, as the church of God for this parish. If we want to do something new, we can't just drop the old and start the new. We have to wait on God. We have to discern if it's right for the church to commit to a new initiative. In ministry, there's a reason why it takes approximately two years to go from, I think I've got a calling from God, to enter in training. Because the process is based entirely on discernment and waiting on God to see exactly what he is calling you to. Don't rush the things of the kingdom. Because it will happen in God's timing. And if we can start to live with that timing, rather than the timing of the world, we will naturally start to slow down and simplify all that we do. One of the easiest ways to slow down is to pause, to stop whatever it is that we're doing and simply focus on our breathing, a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Now, Rob Bell, an American pastor, used to speak about using our breath as a prayer that every breath we take, we are actually saying the Creator's name. Yah. I encourage you to try it. You'll be surprised that as you call on the name of God, how much he will speak to you. Just using the very breath that he gives and calling his name. That was one of the visions I had when we introduced the encounter on a Sunday evening. Leave behind everything. Come and encounter the living God. Take a look at your diary. Add in times before and after meetings, not as contingencies if you're running late, but times where you deliberately slow down and rest in God. Simplicity is the other thing. I'm briefly going to touch on it. Technology is great. You all know how much I like my tech because it's supposed to make life easier. But sometimes it's far more complicated than it actually should be. Whether you're an Apple fan or a Samsung fan, a Windows user or a Mac user, our computers or gadgets are getting smarter and smarter. And with the way AI, AI is now becoming much more mainstream, things feel like they're getting more and more complicated. Indeed, I'll be honest with you, friends. I can't remember the last time I picked up a physical Bible and read it. I read it on here, or I read it on my phone, or I read it on my screen. What if we were to simplify our lives as we slow down Clear out the clutter that we don't need or use. And I'm not just talking about spring cleaning, getting rid of stuff at home. I'm talking about a deeper cleaning, a spiritual cleaning, a spiritual decluttering, if you like. If I briefly touch on the church, if we look at church as the man-made institution, it's incredibly complex. We have lots of rules governing what we can and cannot do, what we should do and what we should not do. We have to have certain elements in a service to make it legal. We have to sign a book at the end as a record of the public worship in the parish. We have the tech set up. Essentially, we are having to choreograph something every week to make it work well. Yet, let's look at the church through the eyes of God. Because actually, the church of God is incredibly simple. It's a community of believers gathering together, sharing their lives, and focusing on the Word of God. What if church was to become like that? How God intended it to be, rather than the man-made mess that it currently is. I truly believe that if we were to do that, church can and will become an agent of change for the world. We are complex beings. We bring all sorts of stuff with us to church. Baggage that we carry around with us. Past hurts. That comment from someone 10 years ago. A sense of wanting to get something out of church for us. But what if we were to simply declutter spiritually, come to church, and be real and honest with one another? No longer hiding behind the mask of, I'm fine. But actually being real and honest with one another of how we are feeling. Again, I think that can then will shift the church's focus into making it a change, a force of change for the world. 
Because there are so many places, in fact, most places where we cannot be ourselves. At work, we're told to vie for the promotion or the pay rise. At home, we're bombarded with advertisements for the next best thing. But if we pause and take a look at Scripture, we see that life of the kingdom is nothing like that. Life of the kingdom is not about how much money we earn or how busy we are. Life in the kingdom of God is about spending quality time with Jesus. John Mark Homer says it's a life of focus in a cultural moment of distraction. It's intentionally living with less to make space for more of what we most value before God. So when everything around us is telling us to go faster, to get busier, to bring in more money, are we going to follow the gospel of the West? Or are we going to say no? I want to simplify and slow down and live the gospel of Jesus. Are we going to spend time with God, truly live in life and faith in all of its fullness to truly be an apprentice of Jesus? Or are we going to be an apprentice of society? Amen.